Hello again and welcome. Today I'd like to go over some of the recent changes that I've made to my software for the Nano VNA. So for this first demonstration I have a phase trimmer as well as a step attenuator. I've got them attached to the Nano VNA V2 Plus 4. So the first thing I'd like to show you is a change that I'd made for the last revision and that was to add these colors. So if you select the start or the stop for example you can see how it denotes that we're in that mode with the green. So if we select CW, you can see now it's highlighted in green. And it doesn't matter the order that you select them. As soon as you select one or the other, it's going to place the VNA in that mode. So let's go to the polar plot. And I'm going to change the CW frequency to 1 gigahertz. So let's just widen this up a little bit. Instead, I'm going to give it a start frequency of 1 gigahertz and a stop frequency of 1.01 gig. So let's go ahead and we can adjust this phase trimmer. And you can see how that causes a rotation around the polar chart. Now let's just change our step attenuator from 0 dB to 10 dB. And we can see how that moves our arc closer to the center of the display. So what I've done is I've added this magnifier feature. Let's go ahead and we'll increase this to 20 dB. And let's change our magnifier to 5x. Here it is at 10x. Let's go on down to 30 dB. And now let's go to 20x gain. Now again, this isn't changing the angle at all. You can see I can continue to rotate around the center axis. Now again, this is only available for the polar display. You can see as I go to transmission rectangular, for example, it turns that feature off. So the next thing I'd like to show you is you notice under T-check that it now shows K-factor. This is something that John Rowlett had introduced. We can use this as one method to determine an amplifier's stability. Of course, if you work on RF amplifier designs, you know that amplifier stability can be a bit of a problem. Keysight made a very good series of videos on amplifier stabilities and different ways that you can test for that. If you're interested in learning more details about that, I suggest that you watch that series. So what we're going to do for this demonstration is we're going to use this standard mini circuit ZFL 1000 LN amplifier. Down here I have our Transco transfer relay. Port 1 is going through a couple of attenuators off to this T and then into the input of the amplifier. The output of the amplifier goes through another attenuator. It goes to another T and then back to the transfer relay. And then across the two T's we have our step attenuator. So we'll use this attenuator to control the amount of feedback from the output back to the input and hopefully cause this amplifier to go unstable. So let's go ahead and we'll link to the Nano. And you can see that the transfer relay is highlighted. Let's just go ahead and enable the sweep. And let's select the transmission rectangular. So you can see even with the attenuators in place, we have about minus 2.5 dB down. So a little bit of attenuation. So now let's change the state of the transfer relay and we'd expect the gain to go way down. Of course we're trying to run the amplifier in reverse. And here you can see we're down at about 48 dB or so. So we can see the amplifier is definitely doing its job. We'll go back to normal mode. And now let's select K factor. You can see the software automatically selects the K factor function. Similar to the T-Check, this is running all four S parameters. And you can see we've got an output of about 145 to 196. So the whole idea of this K-factor, as long as it's above 1, then the amplifier would be unconditionally stable. So now let's change our attenuation. Essentially we're increasing the amount of feedback, and let's see if this amplifier will start to go unstable. And here you can see we've definitely fallen below 1. It's gone all the way down to 0.133. A few of you may have watched the videos where I had entered a design contest for creating the world's fastest breadboard oscillator. And essentially that's all this is, is an amplifier and we have a feedback network in this case. It was just a small piece of wire attached to a pin out here floating off in free space but that's providing the feedback for this amplifier. So in some cases, like this design contest, instability is good. 
but for an amplifier like this instability would definitely be a problem so for this next test I have our solid state transfer relay out attached to port A I have a 100 ohm resistor and port B a 25 ohm resistor doesn't really matter I have not calibrated the unit again that doesn't matter as well let's go ahead and we'll change the state of the transfer relay and you can see how that changes the shape of the waveform so I use this same basic software for all of my network analyzers and some time ago I bought an old Agilent PNA and of course that instrument can send up data a lot faster than what these low-cost nanos can it can also send up more data points and of course that PNA is a four receiver system so for getting all four S parameters that unit is very fast and the problem with my older software is when you would display all four S parameters the graphics couldn't keep up so let's go ahead and select two port sweep and you can see how this is now automatically changing the state of the transfer relay you can also see on the LED when it changes right there and here it's changed back again so let's go to advanced and now we can see all four S parameters being shown let's go ahead and change the number of data points on this to a hundred you can see that it's obviously switching between the two states four times faster as we'd expect let's go even smaller we'll take this down to say 21 data points and you can see now it's basically not changing states you can see that with the relay as well there's another setting that's preventing this from running any faster so if we go to setup diagnostics you can see this refresh it's set for basically 200 milliseconds and that's how often the software is going to service the foreground task you can see that the sweep time right now is 152 milliseconds so the sweep time is actually faster than what we're updating the foreground test. So let's adjust this down to, I don't know, let's give it 50 milliseconds. Now we can see how the transfer relay is changing states again. You can see it's updating much faster. We can take this down even smaller. Let's go to 10 data points. And you can see we're pretty close to that 50. Let's just adjust this thing down even tighter to, let's say, 20 milliseconds. and we can see the display is updating quite a bit faster yet again of course we're only working with 10 data points so the problem with the older software is the smith and the polar plots on this display are the ones that are supplied with lab view so these are not graphics that i've created and the problem was is these graphs are very slow especially the smith chart so i changed all these over to an xy graph and that's dramatically increased the performance of these four plots so at least this part of the software is now able to keep up with my Agilent PNA. Now, of course, this V2 plus 4, this was the last VNA that OWO's company had worked on. This is actually a pretty nice unit, but they've talked about doing a version 3. And of course, one of the features that they're touting is that unit would be able to send up even more data and it would do it faster than the V2 plus 4. So if they ever do produce that product, it's going to make porting this software over to that that much simpler because it'll already handle the higher data throughput. All right, for this last demonstration, I have a couple of pieces of coax. Let's go ahead and we'll attach our first piece of coax. Now let's switch it over to the TDR mode. So we go to Advanced, Time Domain. So one of the things you may notice is that there are now two scales. The left one is looking at the step impedance and the right scales for the impulse so we can see right now we have a 50 ohm cable attached and there's nothing terminated on the back side so essentially it just goes off into infinite and let's just try connecting our pink cable and you can see this is a 75 ohm cable if we were to reconnect our 50 ohm cable and now let's put our 75 ohm cable to the back side of it you can see you end up with this step function again going between 50 ohms and 75 ohms so the way the software now makes this measurement it's quite a bit different than what I was doing originally so the original software there's a checkbox in the upper menu here that says Beatty standard that was developed by Robert Beatty 
it would then measure the 25 and the 50 ohms off of that standard then it would just use a simple point slope calculation to measure other impedances so my original software didn't require that we actually perform the SOL calibration so the nice thing about that is it was a very fast way to take impedance measurements the downside to it is of course it's not a standard way of doing that measurement so the software now is just using the S parameters to calculate the impedance so right now it's not even been calibrated if we go to main and I'll select 2 port cal old and I'm going to select a 100 kilohertz to 4.4 gigahertz you can see that's changed and now let's go to advanced and you can see it's basically now spot on at 50 ohms let's go ahead and zoom into the vertical axis we'll set this to 100 you can see this pink cable has an impedance of I don't know about 77 ohms or so alright let's go ahead and we'll get our Beatty standard out again this is what I'm using to calibrate my network analyzer so this goes from 50 ohms to 25 ohms back to 50 and that 25 ohm segment is 70 millimeters long so on the back side of this I have a precision 50 ohm terminator and then on the right we have our end SMA adapter and of course we're going to connect this to port 1 of the B2 plus 4 and let's auto scale the Y axis and auto scale the X axis as well so we can see that essentially it starts off at 50 ohms it dips down to 25 ohms and then it goes back up to 50 ohms pretty much what we'd expect so there's a couple of features one is this show markers and you can see now we have these two blue vertical lines so these are showing where we're trying to measure a peak or a valley in the data and of course the full width half height is measuring the distance between the two markers you'll notice there's another checkbox to the right of that which is show zoom so this is zooming into the area around the two markers and again we can see it's starting off at 50 ohms working its way down to 25 and then back up let's go ahead and we'll turn off the auto scale and let's zoom into the X a little bit and you can see now how the two cursors align with the impulse waveform let's change this marker index to a negative one now we're measuring from the start of the data to this first dip and you can see our distance is roughly 80 millimeters of course you can change the scaling of this from meters to inches to seconds to samples and of course that'll change the scaling of the two graphs so somebody had posted how they were trying to do this measurement with a low number of samples so again if we go to the main and of course we're running 401 data points and they were running this thing below 50 data points let's just set it to 50 and we'll go to advanced again and auto scale X and you can see how the screen is updating quite a bit faster and of course as we continue to reduce this number let's just take it down to 20 you can see how the screen is updating quite a bit quicker now let's go ahead and we'll turn off the auto scale X and the auto scale Y let's do the same thing for the impedance and let's just bump this thing up to 100 ohms you can see how quick this thing is updating now so the way that this software is structured there's basically three primary threads one of those threads is receiving data from the V2 plus 4 and then it's putting it into a message queue and it's passing it up to another thread that's going through that data and packaging it up into a single frame once that's done it's handed up to the main processing loop and what you're doing by changing the data set size is of course you're having the foreground loop do a lot more processing it's doing it for a smaller data set but it takes time to run those algorithms now again I could change this software to basically limit the number of data points that the user places into it we could set it to something reasonable like you know 101 maybe 50 at best normally people want to go with more data points not less but yeah again I wrote this software for my own use and typically I don't want the software to limit what I'm using it for so of course you could set that to you know five data points or whatever and the software is going to crash but I'm assuming that that's not something that the average user is going to be doing. 
let's just change it back to 201 data points and let's change everything back to the auto scale now let's just zoom into this area a little bit so you get an idea of what the shape of this looks like now let's change our frequency to something much smaller let's just go down to 2 gig you see how that's really rounded off all these edges we can go even lower let's go to a gig now you can see it's really getting rounded again if you're trying to resolve very short distances that's going to be a function of the sweep range not the number of samples but if you really want to get some sharp edges you would want to get above even what this network analyzer is capable of maybe you want to be looking at like an 8720 or something something like that would certainly do a much better job of TDR measurement than the V2 plus 4 so let's just keep our frequency at a gigahertz and let's drop the number of points to 100 and you can see it has not changed the shape of this waveform at all what that is doing is limiting the length of the transmission line that we're able to measure so I currently have all the software updated to this latest revision I have not yet tested the software for the original Nano VNA and I also have not updated the manual just yet so hopefully over the next week or two I'll get all these updates placed back up on GitHub and I think that's going to be it for this video so hopefully it gives you some idea where I'm heading with this software if you have any questions just feel free to leave them in the comments until the next video stay safe and we'll see you then later